you can say it's a great pleasure and uh, honor for me to introduce uh, Connor Mooney from uh, University of California Irvine, who will talk about the best time problem for parametric elliptic functions. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'd also like to begin by thanking Enrico and all the rest of the organizers for uh, putting together such a nice uh, online seminar series. It's really a great pleasure to be part of it. <clears throat> so today I'll discuss uh, the so-called Bernstein problem. And the reason I chose this topic is because I think it's a, a very central problem in the development of geomet geometric analysis over the last century or so. And to begin with, I would just like to uh, say, recall what Bernstein's beautiful theorem is. So around 1915, Bernstein showed the following, which is that if you have, uh, let's say, a smooth solution to the minimal surface equation in all of R2, and that's this divergence form elliptic equation here, then the solution has to be a linear function. So its graph is a, a plane in R3. So this theorem, uh, it says something interesting. Basically, it says that if you have uh, a minimal graph in three dimensions, and uh, <clears throat> it has non-zero curvature, so let's say you write it as the graph over a tangent plane somewhere which has non-zero curvature, then eventually this graph has to become vertical. If it didn't, then you'd have a global solution and it would be a plane. <clears throat> And I find this theorem uh, quite surprising in a way because the minimal surface equation is sort of like the nonlinear, the geometric counterpart of the Laplace equation in the sense that if you write the gra minimal surface in R3 as the graph over a tangent plane, then the equation becomes the Laplace equation at the point of tangency. On the other hand, there are a huge number of harmonic functions in R2. For example, you could take the real part of any holomorphic function, like e to the e to the e to the z, and these functions can have uh, you know, very, very rapid growth. So <clears throat> this is a situation where the nonlinearity of the equation helps you uh, obtain a rigidity result. And uh, the Bernstein problem asks whether the same result can be extended to higher dimensions. So whether you can change this number two to n with arbitrary n. And in the first part of the talk, I'd like to uh, briefly review the solution of this problem. So this problem is completely solved. And uh, then discuss some extensions of this theorem to related equations. Okay. So the solution to the Bernstein problem is the next topic. And as we mentioned, it was first proved in two dimensions by Bernstein in 1915. And his original proof is uh, extremely interesting. It's based on the restrictive topology of R2. And because the idea is so beautiful, I just want to briefly review it. And it's based on the following uh, observation, which is that if you have a saddle-shaped function in two dimensions, so if you have something that has negative Hessian determinant in 2D, <coughs> then all the tangent planes to the graph of this function have to split the graph into at least four disconnected components that extend all the way to infinity. And the reason for that is very simple. So in this picture, you could imagine that the blue is the nodal set of, U, of W. And if for some reason it closed up, then W would be forced to have an interior maximum. But at that point, there's no way it could have negative Hessian determinant. It would be non-negative Hessian determinant at that point. <clears throat> and using this basic observation, which is actually used a number of times in the theory of elliptic PDEs in two dimensions, Bernstein showed <clears throat> that any, say, any global solution to an elliptic equation in 2D, even degenerate elliptic, which is bounded, for example, has to be a constant function. So it's non-trivial to show this from the topological fact, but he did show it. And in fact, it's, uh, he proves it for any global solution to an elliptic equation, which has sublinear growth at 
So this is just a, a geometric result about solutions to elliptic equations in two dimensions. And that's the first part of Bernstein's, say, proof of the theorem. And the second part was to apply that result to a special, so so, so far the, uh, the minimal surface equation hasn't entered the picture. And where it enters the picture is that this funny function, the inverse tangent of a directional derivative of a solution to the minimal surface equation happens to be a saddle-shaped function, solves some elliptic equation. And uh, <clears throat> the, the fact is that it's harmonic on the graph of a solution to the minimal surface equation. And I don't know exactly how Bernstein thought of this originally, but uh, one way to see this sort of comes from complex analysis. If you have a, a minimal surface in R3, then the Gauss map is a conformal map into the sphere. And so you have techniques from complex analysis that come into play. And this tangent inverse arises as looking at the, the angle of some uh, conformal mapping. Okay. So this was uh, Bernstein's original approach. <clears throat> and in the intervening years between 1915 and say early 1960s, there were several new proofs that appeared, but they were all based on complex analysis in some way, and they didn't have uh, any obvious generalization to higher dimensions. And it wasn't until 1962 that Fleming came up with a new proof which seemed to have a hope of generalizing. And this was based on a completely new tool <clears throat> and uh, known as the monotonicity formula, which roughly says that minimal surfaces in arbitrary dimension have a conical structure either at very small or very large scales. So for example, if you have a global solution to the minimal surface equation, if you keep on zooming out and zooming out and zooming out, then the graphs eventually converge to an area minimizing cone in Rn plus one. So this was Fleming's idea. Using the monotonicity formula, he showed that if you have a non-trivial solution of the minimal surface equation in Rn, then there has to exist a non-flat area minimizing cone in Rn plus one. And from this, he could relatively quickly conclude that, uh, say the Bernstein theorem in 2D, from the fact that if you look at uh, cones in three dimensions, then one of the curvatures has to vanish. So if one curvature vanishes and it's minimal, then the other curvature also has to vanish. So the only option is a, high, is a, a plane. And this was uh, Fleming's new proof. Then a few years later, uh, DeGiorgi improved to one dimension higher by using a similar idea. What he showed is that this non-flat area minimizing hypercone that Fleming constructed has to have a special structure. It's a cylindrical structure. It has to be an area minimizing hypercone C in one dimension lower in Rn cross R. And so we could boost the dimension a little bit. So the picture to keep in mind would be something like this. A global minimal graph, which is not a <clears throat> A hyperplane would have to blow down to something like this, a non-trivial cone C cross R. All right. And then finally, uh, the Bernstein theorem was extended up to dimension seven by Almgren and Simons in 1966 and in 1968. And what they showed was that uh, so I guess Fleming's observation reduced the problem to the study of minimum, if area minimizing cones in Rn. And they showed that stable minimal cones have to be flat in both dimensions. So they, they didn't really need the full information that uh, uh, the cone is area minimizing. If it's just minimizing under tiny perturbations, then it has to be a hyperplane in low dimensions. And this comes from the, the stability inequality and plugging in some very clever test functions into a stability inequality. And finally, just one year later in 1969, uh, Bombieri, De Giorgi, and Giusti constructed uh, very surprising, very beautiful counterexamples to the Bernstein theorem. So they constructed examples of a, 
So it's non nonlinear entire solutions to the minimal surface equation and R H, which have cubic growth at infinity. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. Uh, but one comment I have that could be interesting is that uh, I read somewhere that uh, Bombieri, De Giorgi, and Giusti, they solved this problem basically in three days. So they got together and they worked very hard nonstop for three days until they cracked it. And so I guess there was a real sense of urgency to solve this problem at that time. Okay. But anyhow, that uh, they solved the Bernstein problem. And to conclude uh, the introductory discussion, I'd just like to mention uh, what happens in higher dimensions. Well, we know that the Bernstein theorem fails in dimensions eight and higher, but you could ask if you add some growth hypotheses, what happens? So for example, we know that a harmonic function with polynomial growth has to be a polynomial. If we impose some additional conditions, we can get rigidity results sometimes. And some examples of these results are if you have a, a global solution with a bounded gradient, then it has to be a, a linear function. And this is due to, to Georgie and John Nash in the late 50s. And uh, the key here is basically that when the gradient is bounded, the equation becomes uniformly elliptic. So the Harnack inequality of the Georgie and Nash can be applied. <coughs> uh, another See, a related result is that if a solution has linear growth, then it's a, a linear function. And this is due to an interior gradient estimate, very deep and difficult result of Bombieri, De Giorgi, and Miranda from uh, 1969. And uh, this result also plays a central role in uh, Bombieri, De Giorgi, and Giusti's construction, which we'll talk about soon. And the best result I know of in terms of controlled growth, Bernstein theorems is the result of Ecker and Hoiskin from 1990. And this says that if the gradient grows sublinearly, so this corresponds to solutions that have slightly slower than quadratic growth, uh, then the solution has to be linear. And this is a different sort of argument that uses the uh, Jacobi equation for the components of the unit normal to the graph along with the Simons inequality for the Laplace of the second fundamental theorem. Okay, but uh, to finish this part of the discussion, let me just mention a few of my favorite open problems in the area, which uh, are related to what we've discussed so far. So the first is that all the examples of global solutions of the minimal surface equation that we know have polynomial growth. So we don't have very many examples. There's just Bombieri de Giorgi Giusti, and a few examples constructed by Leon Simon in 1989. And they all grow polynomially at infinity. And a natural question is, do all entire solutions have to have polynomial growth? So I saw that this question was asked in a, a beautiful paper of uh, Bombieri and Giusti um, from the 70s. And uh, to my knowledge, there's essentially no progress on this problem since that time. So it could be pretty challenging. Some new ideas are needed to attack it. You know, one could think that probably what one wants to do is to take a global solution and try to infer information about it from its tangent cone at infinity. But this is quite difficult because we don't know in general that this tangent cone is unique. And uh, this is, complicates things quite a bit. And another question one could ask is that, does there exist a nonlinear polynomial that solves the minimal surface equation? And this question has a more algebraic nature. And uh, you could ask, you know, for example, in a million dimensions, can you construct some crazy polynomial that solves the minimal surface equation? Uh, honestly, I've got no idea, but uh, it seems like a very interesting problem. All right. So, <clears throat> Rather than pursue these two questions here, a natural thing is to ask, uh, okay, well, does this Bernstein theorem generalize to some natural class of geometric equations which has the minimal surface equation as a special example? And that's the direction we're gonna go now. And this is where we bring in the so-called uh, parametric elliptic functionals into the picture. So 
Rather than studying the area functional, you could study uh, slightly more general functionals that have this form here. So we'll be interested in, again, hypersurfaces in Rn plus one. And we asked that they minimize integrals of a certain weighted area. So you have the area element appearing, but you weigh the area element by this function phi, which depends on the direction of the unit normal to the hypersurface. And we asked that phi is a, is a norm. So it's one homogeneous, positive, and smooth on the unit sphere. And it's a convex function. And we say this is a parametric elliptic functional if this uh, level sets are uniformly convex. <laughs> so functionals like this appear naturally, for example, in Finsler geometry or in models of crystal surfaces. In fact, this is so-called crystalline norm if these sublevel sets are uh, polytopes in Rn plus one. But we're just going to focus on a very classical case of a uniform ellipticity. And uh, I think the easiest way to see why this is known as uniform ellipticity is to look at the Euler-Lagrange equation associated to this function. So if you have a hypersurface that minimizes it, then of course it's a critical point, so it solves the Euler-Lagrange equation. And this is just uh, that sum, weighted sum of the principal curvatures of the hypersurface sigma is zero. So this phi ij of nu is like second derivatives of phi on the tangent plane to the sphere at the point nu. And this has, say, eigenvalues bounded between positive constants by the convexity conditions. And this 2ij is the uh, second fundamental form of the hypersurface. So, so you could think that in the case of the area functional, or phi is one on the unit sphere, this is just that the sum of the principal curvatures is zero, and the mean curvature vanishes. <clears throat> Okay, and the so-called Phi-Bernstein theorem just asks the same question that we did for the minimal surface equation, which is the following. If you have a, a hypersurface, which minimizes one of these parametric elliptic functionals and happens to be the graph of a function over all of Rn, then is this function necessarily linear or is this surface necessarily a hybrid? Okay. So this is a fairly well-studied problem. Oh, sorry, before I go on, I'd like to briefly connect, say, this Euler-Lagrange equation written in geometric form to, uh, say, the PDE that you might typically see in a textbook or something like that. So if we look at this Euler-Lagrange equation for a hypersurface sigma, we write it as a graph u of x, then, uh, there's a way of writing it as a PDE for u, basically by projecting down onto the hyperplane over which sigma is written as a graph. And it becomes this uh, quasi-linear elliptic equation of the form phi ij at gradient u times uij is equal to zero, where this function little phi is just the integrand capital phi restricted to a hyperplane at uh, tangent to the sphere. And the easiest way to see that, I think, is to just rewrite the functional in terms of uh, the function u. So the integral of phi of nu is the same thing as the integral of phi of, well, the unit normal in terms of the function u is this expression. <clears throat> and the area element is, say, square root of one plus gradient squared dx. And by the one homogeneity of phi, the numerator and denominator here cancel, and so we get that this is the same thing as the integral of some convex function of the gradient of u. And this equation here is just the, the typical Euler-Lagrange equation of functionals of this type. And the, the remark I wanted to make was that the ellipticity of this equation degenerates as the gradient gets very large in a very similar way to what happens for the minimal surface equation. The reason is that this function little phi is asymptotically one homogeneous. Okay. So let me review quickly what's known about the, the Bernstein theorem for these more general class of elliptic equations. So the first result, due to Jenkins in 1961, 
is that the Bernstein property is true for these equations in two dimensions. So global solutions to these equations of minimal surface type are linear functions in 2D. And the idea uh, is again related to complex analysis. So now the, the Gauss map of a minimizer of one of these parametric elliptic functionals is not conformal necessarily, but it's quasi-conformal. And basically what Jenkins shows is that uh, the global quasi-conformal maps, which are bounded, there's a map into the unit sphere, has to be a constant. And then Leon Simon extended this to dimension three in 1977. And uh, this is quite interesting, I think. Uh, you know, typically in elliptic PDEs, if I see a result is true in two dimensions, then I don't necessarily have a lot of hope that it generalizes to higher dimensions. But if I see it's true in 3D, then I think, oh, well, maybe it has a hope. <clears throat> and uh, Leon Simon's proof really is quite different from Jenkins' proof, and it relies on a very difficult regularity theorem of Almgren, Shane, and Simon uh, from the same year. And then uh, a couple more things. Again, the Bernstein theorem for these uh, parametric elliptic functionals holds up to the same dimension as for the minimal surface equation if the functional is very close to the area functional, which maybe is not too surprising. And finally, if you impose some growth conditions, then you have the Bernstein theorem. So in particular, if the gradient is bounded, then these equations do become uniformly elliptic. So the Georgie nash harnack inequality applies. Or if the function has linear growth, then an interior gradient estimate due to Leon Simon applies. And so again, you have bounded gradient and solutions are linear. But in any case, uh, there's a, a significant gap in the theory in that you don't know what happens from what I've said so far, between dimensions four and seven. And so it's natural to ask, if you look at these more general elliptic functionals, uh, does the same Bernstein theorem hold as for the minimal surface case? Or in other words, so is there something, do you really need it to be a minimal surface, or is there something more general about the functions that you're studying that uh, implies that these Bernstein type theorems hold? And the main theorem I'd like to state takes a definite step towards closing this gap. And the theorem is the following, is that indeed for these more general elliptic equations, uh, the Bernstein theorem becomes different. So there exist nonlinear entire solutions, in fact, a quadratic polynomial in six dimensions. Uh, and the graph of this nonlinear polynomial minimizes a uniformly elliptic function. So what this theorem says basically is that uh, <clears throat> indeed there was something special about the isotropy of the area functional that allows one to prove a Bernstein theorem up through dimension seven. So when you relax this, you can construct nonlinear entire solutions in lower dimensions. And a few comments I'd like to make before going on is that first, the integrand phi that I constructed in this theorem is necessarily far from one on the unit sphere. In other words, the functional that we're minimizing is necessarily not too close to the area functional. And that's because uh, Leon Simon showed that if the functional were close to the area functional, then we would have linearity of global solutions up through dimensions, just like the minimal surface case. As we'll see, the level sets of this function phi are sort of box shaped. <clears throat> And the next remark I'd like to make is that the quadratic polynomial that happens to work in six dimensions has a very natural analog in four dimensions. This would be the lowest possible dimension in which one could hope to construct nonlinear entire solutions. But it turns out that this polynomial doesn't work in R4. So uh, one can show that it doesn't minimize any uh, uniformly elliptic functional in four dimensions. And so some new ideas would be needed to push this uh, construction down to the optimal dimension and the optimal, say these, these remaining dimensions four and five uh, are still open, but I do have strong opinions about what happens there. And I'll talk about that in the, the last part of this talk. Okay. <clears throat> 
So <clears throat> in the remaining part of the talk, I'd like to uh, discuss what goes into the construction of, uh, to the proof of this theorem. And to begin with, I think it's natural just to briefly recall what Bombieri, De Giorgi, and Giusti did in the minimal surface case in R8. Because this, I think, sets up the ideas for the, the construction that I did in uh, R6. Okay, so in, uh, in R8, what Bombieri, De Giorgi, and Giusti did, well, I think that they were guided by this philosophy that you have to be able to construct uh, a candidate for a tangent cone to a nonlinear global solution to the minimal surface equation at infinity, and it has to be a non-trivial cone. And so the starting point for them is to look at look for non-trivial minimal cones in R8. And the most natural one to look for is the so-called Simons cone, which is the cone uh, mod x is equal to mod y, where we look at say coordinates where x and y are in R4. So uh, I think I'll go to a picture. It's easier just to, to work with the picture when I describe what they did. So this cone is obviously uh, has zero mean curvature because of its symmetries. It looks the same from both sides. So it's a natural candidate for an area minimizing cone, but showing that it's area minimizing was quite a challenge. And the way they did this was by constructing a, a smoothed out version of this minimal cone by <laughs> constructing, say, a, a minimal surface which is asymptotic to the cone at infinity. And this minimal surface, which I call sigma in the picture, happens to approach the cone at a special rate. So if you move out a distance r along the cone, the smooth minimal surface is roughly a distance r to the minus 2 from the Simon's cone. OK. And this is very special to eight dimensions. I'll say why in just a second. This was the step one of their construction. They construct this minimal surface that's asymptotic to the cone. And then by taking dilations of this surface, you obtain a foliation of either side of the Simon's cone, which, uh, <clears throat> which sort of hugs the Simon's cone as these get closer and closer inside. So basically, I mean, is a, uh, a general philosophy, anytime you manage to find a foliation by critical points, then each of the leaves in the foliation has to be an absolute minimizer. And what they noticed is that this surface uh, sigma, which is a smooth perturbation of the Simon's cone, looks like the level set of a cubic homogeneous function. So roughly it looks like the level set of this function, which I call r cubed cosine of 2 theta, where r is distance from origin and theta is the inverse tangent of mod y over mod x. <clears throat> and uh, the reason that this cubic homogeneity comes in is related to this approach rate of the minimal surface sigma to the Simon's cone. You could think if you have a function which is 1 on the surface and vanishes on the cone, and a distance r from the origin, it uh, takes a distance r to the minus 2 to go from 0 to 1. So that corresponds to gradient growth, which is quadratic, which is like uh, cubic growth of the function itself. OK. <clears throat> and this basically serves as a level 0 guess for what a nonlinear global solution could look like. And the last step that they do is they build global super and sub solutions, which have this cubic growth. And this is a, happens to be the very hard part of the problem. Well, actually, this function that I've written down here turns out to be a subsolution where it's positive, the minimal surface equation. But they work very hard to construct a perturbation of this function, which is a super solution. And then they use these uh, to trap solutions to the Dirichlet problem in larger and larger domains. So this construction is based on the maximum principle. Okay. And one quick remark, one could ask, what happens if we lower this dimension four to three? So what goes wrong in lower dimensions if you attempt to do the same thing? And what goes wrong is the following, is that if you attempt to find a smooth perturbation of the analog of the Simon's cone in lower dimensions, then it doesn't stay on one side of the cone. It starts to oscillate around the cone a little bit. <clears throat> 
And so that means its dilation is no longer full. Right? So this is just a fun observation. Okay. <clears throat> so now I'll talk a bit about uh, the approach to the main theorem of constructing a global solution in six dimensions to an equation of minimal surface type. And the approach is uh, massively different. So we'll basically forget everything we know about elliptic equations for a little bit, because the, the approach now is entering the realm of hyperbolic PDE. So the philosophy to build counterexamples to classes of equations, instead to fix candidates for solutions. So we'll fix the solution U, or so what we hope is the solution, and we'll build the integrand phi. And this is sort of like an inverse problem, which changes the problem from being elliptic to hyperbolic. So let me be a little bit more specific about that. So let's sort of call it the equation that we want to solve has this form, phi i j at gradient u, u i j is zero. So this is some quasi-linear elliptic equation for u. <clears throat> and here, just to remind you that this little phi is this integrand capital phi restricted to a hyperbolic. And the trick is to rewrite this equation in terms of the Legendre transform of u. So if you don't know about Legendre transform, don't worry too much. Uh, you could think of it as uh, an operation which inverts gradients and takes second derivatives to inverses of what they were before. And the Legendre transform is defined also in the gradient space of u. And so what this takes the problem into is a linear hyperbolic equation for the function phi. The u star upper ij times phi lower ij is equal to zero. And the reason that it's hyperbolic is that the candidates that we're going to choose will have to have positive and negative principal curvatures in the graphs. So this matrix here, u star ij, will have positive and negative eigenvalues. And so it'll have a, a mixed signs of the coefficients. OK. So philosophically, what we're doing is we're if we solve this hyperbolic equation, then we get solutions to this problem. And so it's, it's sort of like uh, this function u defines some crystal surface and we're sending waves through the surface. And by doing so, we're constructing all the possible functions for which u is a critical point. And we just pray that one of these uh, functionals for which, u, for which u is a critical point has the right convexity properties. And that's the hard part. So let's get a little bit more specific. Now that we know the strategy, uh, the idea is, let's say, let's take, say, um, following the idea of Bambieri de Giorgi Giusti, let's take coordinates in R2K, where X and Y are points in RK, and we'll fix our candidate solution to be the simple quadratic polynomial, simple symmetric quadratic polynomial, X squared minus Y squared. So this vanishes on the symmetric say, analog of the Simons cone in R2K. And it has constant second derivatives, which make this uh, equation very nice. And if we choose phi to have the same symmetries as u, so it's a rotation invariant in the x and y variable, then this linear equation becomes quite simple. It just becomes the wave equation plus some lower order uh, term. So this box phi is the wave operator in R2. And this lower order term is singular. And uh, this is like phi s divided by s minus phi t divided by t. So it's singular along the axes. But nonetheless, I'm pretty happy when I see this because it's a fairly simple uh, linear hyperbolic equation of two variables, which hopefully becomes more manageable. Okay, so so far we haven't seen anything special about R6 come into the picture. But at this stage we will. And that becomes, uh, let's say, it's, it's not obvious at all what's happening, but this coefficient k minus 1 is very important in the analysis of solutions to this hyperbolic equation. And when we plug in k is equal to 3, the structure becomes extremely special. The reason is that the equation just reduces to the classic wave equation. It becomes the wave operator on st times psi is equal to zero. 
And so we have very explicit representation formulae for solutions. We can write down Psi explicitly as the sum of two traveling waves. It's just the classic D'Alembert formula divided by uh, uh, S times T, a quadratic polynomial. So now, basically, we, in R6, we have a huge number of functionals for which this quadratic x squared minus y squared is a critical point. And the tricky part is to choose f and g so that this functional has all the right convexity properties. And I'm not going to say too much about that. Maybe I'll just say the following. If you look at the structure of this expression, we see that it's uh, f plus g divided by a quadratic polynomial. And we want this function psi to be one homogeneous asymptotically. So it's natural to choose f and g to be functions which are asymptotically three homogeneous because we divide this expression by a two homogeneous function. And all I really want to say is that uh, in the end, the integrand capital phi that we choose is not very complicated algebraically. As we see, it's this uh, three homogeneous function on the numerator divided by this two homogeneous function on the denominator. <clears throat> so it's not too hard to write down. But uh, I don't think, uh, I don't get too much out of just looking at this expression. So instead, I'd like to emphasize something more geometric about it, which is, uh, it's interesting to look at the geometry of this function phi. So it turns out that the level sets of this function phi, of course, they're not round, but they're slightly box shaped. So it's like you take the, the sphere, which is the level set of the, uh, the integrand for the area functional, and you deform it a little bit so that uh, <clears throat> it sort of goes a little further out in the directions of the Simons cone, and it's flattened a little bit in the chord directions. And this is actually quite intuitive. And the reason is that this quadratic polynomial x squared minus y squared has unit normals which overwhelmingly point in the direction of the, the Simons cone. So we expect that the integrand, whatever it is, grows more slowly in those directions than in the other directions. And that's exactly what we see in this picture. So this picture here is just the level set of the function, cap, or the integrand capital phi, uh, intersected with x7 is equal to zero. Okay. And then the last part of the talk, I'd just like to make a few small remarks and further directions, especially related to what happens in four dimensions. So the first small remark is that there are many possible choices of the integrand capital phi that will work. So if we choke, you take the little f and little g that happen to work and we make tiny perturbations, then those will still satisfy the correct uh, convexity conditions. So the capital phi that was written down here is not the only choice, but it just happens to be a particularly simple one. The second remark I'd like to make is that the fact that u is a quadratic polynomial is kind of interesting because it forces every single level set to minimize a the same parametric elliptic functional. So it turns out that all the level sets of this quadratic polynomial they minimize a phi naught, where phi naught is the integrand phi that we constructed, but restricted to x7 is equal to zero. And this is just a product of the homogeneity of the function u. But because u is too homogeneous, using the scaling invariance of uh, minimizers, you can show that all the multiples of u are also solutions to the same equation. So if you look at all the multiples of u, and you slide them down, you could think that you can uh, basically get any level set of the function u cross r by doing transformations like this. So in particular, all the level sets have to be uh, minimizers of the same elliptic function. And this is, uh, say, not specific to this problem, but just it holds for any homogeneous solution to an equation of minimal surface time. The reason I wanted to bring this up is because it leads us to a discussion of what happens in lower dimensions. So, so I'd like to construct uh, a nonlinear global solution to a minimal surface type equation in the lowest possible dimension, 4D, 
but there happens to be a serious obstruction coming from this observation. The reason is the following. If you look at the quadratic polynomial x squared minus y squared in four dimensions, so the case k is equal to two, then by the above remark, every level set, or in particular the one level set, has to minimize a uniformly elliptic function. But it turns out that in four dimensions, this is false. And this is actually not very hard to show just by using the symmetries of this level set and some ODE analysis. So that's really the difference between four and six dimensions. I don't really have a good intuitive geometric reason for this. It's really some analytic reason. On the other hand, it's known that the zero level set of this polynomial, so the cone over the Clifford torus, in uh, R4 does minimize a uniformly elliptic function. So this gives some hope that one might be able to construct global solutions in 4D. But you can't choose this quadratic polynomial. And some current work that uh, is ongoing with my PhD student Yang is uh, <coughs> let's say, an approach to the problem in four dimensions that sort of combines what Bombieri de Giorgi Giusti did and what I did in six dimensions. So basically, there's just two steps that I think could be used to construct nonlinear global solutions in 4D. The first is a uh, proof by foliation of Morgan's theorem. So Morgan's theorem that the cone C minimizes a uniformly elliptic functional and uh, in 4D uses the so-called calibration technique, where you construct a divergence-free vector field that satisfies a very special inequality. But rather than do the calibration technique, one could try to do, uh, do the same thing, but do by foliations, like Bombieri de Giorgi Giusti did. And it looks like, say, very hopeful that this is possible. One could foliate the other side of the Simons cone in R4, but these hypersurfaces that foliate they don't look like level sets of quadratic polynomials, but they look like level sets of functions which are homogeneous of degree less than two. So that agrees with this previous observation that the quadratic polynomial won't work. And so this leads to step two. So the natural guess at this point would be, let's try to fix uh, a, uh, a function u, which is asymptotically homogeneous of some degree which is less than two. And then once we fix that, try to solve a hyperbolic equation to get an integrand phi with the correct properties, just like we did in six dimensions. Okay. And the last, the last thing I want to say is some, say some other interesting questions one could ask about these parametric elliptic functionals and the corresponding equations or for example, the controlled growth question. So if you impose something about the growth of the gradient of a global solution, can you get a Bernstein type theorem? And uh, <clears throat> it seems natural to guess that if the gradient grows slowly enough, you could get a Bernstein theorem. If the gradient grows like x, x to the epsilon, where this epsilon depends on dimension or the properties of the integrand, it could be possible. And some other interesting questions could be questions about the regularity of the integrands that we produce with these approaches. So in the construction that I described uh, during this talk, the integrand is actually C21, it's not C3. But I think this is really a technical thing. It could be interesting to, to press a little harder and see if you can get integrands which are smooth or real analytic, for example. Okay. And uh, with that, that's all I have to say about the topic. And I'd like to thank you all for your attention and to invite any questions. Okay, so I think that uh, we are all uh, amused and delighted by your beautiful talk and for the exceptional results presented. And are there any questions? Why people think about intelligent questions, I will ask a couple of silly questions. The first is, how did you even think about uh, proving such a result, right? What, did you have in mind uh, Frank Morgan's result in R4?
because I would say that most of the people would bet uh, on dimension eight, right, to be the, the, the threshold. Right. Yeah, so this is a good, great question. So <clears throat> I, I think, yeah, I think I was definitely motivated by Frank Morgan's result in four dimensions, that there's this, uh, the Simons cone in R4 minimizes a parametric elliptic functional. So this really gave hope that one could construct these examples in lower than eight dimensions. Uh, okay, I think that Ben Andrews has a question. Hi, yes, Connor, thanks for the lovely talk. Um, so you mentioned that the, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, sorry. Um, you mentioned that the, the level sets of this function you end up with are somehow box shaped. And uh, I guess what, in an extreme situation one could consider the case when it's really polyhedral, right? You have a, you know, a wolf shape. Which is a or Do you get any insight by thinking about those extreme situations here? That's a great question. So uh, I would really love to have a proof where you begin just with the, you know, as you say, the cube yeah. for which probably this uh, quadratic polynomial is obviously a minimizer and then make a tiny deformation. Uh, I don't, I don't see an obvious way of doing this. Yeah. And the reason is the following. So in, in Morgan's proof that the Simon's cone is minimizing in 4D, this is really the insight that works. But somehow one of the reasons that it works is that the, the unit normals to the Simon's cone only fill a very small subset of the sphere. Whereas if you're looking at, uh, the unit normals to uh, say a global minimal graph, they fill in the full upper hemisphere. So somehow something different has to happen. Uh, so whatever, whatever you want to comes up with, uh, you could imagine starting off with the cube, but it has to be really sort of smooth and almost like the sphere at the top before it becomes more cube-like on the sides. So I, I really love to find a proof that, as you suggest, that's sort of a like small perturbation of the cube, but I don't really see how. Yeah, thanks. Other questions or comments? Well, again, maybe while other people think about uh, good questions, I, I also was wondering about the, uh, the crystal inversion, but I think you have already answered that. How about higher dimensions? Because on the one hand, uh, one can think, okay, why do we encounter examples in higher dimensions since we have already the, the ones with phi equal to one. But on the other hand, one can suspect that uh, oscillating phi or uh, shapes different than the sphere can produce additional rigidity for the same reasons for which uh, uh, minimal surfaces are more rigid than the linear counterpart, right? Ah, I see. So I haven't thought about this at all, actually. So you're asking, uh, can you impose conditions on an integrand which increase the dimension? Yes. Or so that's very, yeah, I've got no idea. It's, okay. Yeah. Just yeah, for, for you. This k equal to three was very special for the cancellation, if I understand. So it's not that you yeah. can let k larger, okay? Right, right. Yes, of course. Of course, once you have example in low dimensions, then it's automatically an example in higher dimensions. That's with one but trivial reaction, right? Exactly, just by extension. So, yeah, that's a good. I'll, I'll think about that and I'll let you know if I have any <laughs> idea. So I, I, I'm not very good uh, with, uh, with Zoom, so I don't know if there are any other questions, but if not, uh, I think that you are all welcome to the Zoom coffee break and we can meet again there. Sounds good. I don't know if Daniel... Uh, Okay, there are no other questions, so we can meet at the coffee break, at the virtual, unfortunately, coffee break. See you in a while. I closed the session. Okay. <laughs>